found it very interesting because um, the way before uh, I learned about this uh, conceptual metaphor theory, so Kavice, um, where they think that uh, some kind of cultural, cultural knowledge is stored in our, evoked in our metonymies and uh, metaphors. So I found that very interesting that you found that these categories are stored in the children and they learn that way. So would you say if you have given the same way to bilingual children, would you say you, I think you say how would they grasp the concept of the economy? Um, what, what do you mean by the categories are, are stored? With, uh, I mean, mm, like you mean like the, the schemas? Yes, the schemas. Yeah, okay. yes, sorry, schemas. Um, I, yeah, I think that, um, yeah, so whether you would be able to use a schema that you had for like order in English for, mm -hmm. uh, uh, oh, because sometimes you have different schemas in different yeah, practices, right, that right, right, so right, how, right. Uh, right. Um, I, I, I don't really have a sense of how much bilingual children can kind of, uh, draw into their conceptual structures of the, mm -hmm. of the other language if they differ. Um, do you have a... Um, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Maybe that would be very cool. Interesting to know. Right, for sure. So, uh, I have a question about partial meaning. So mm -hmm. I'm a little confused about what would count as a full meaning. Because mm -hmm. like, it seems like we can always be more specific about like open the door next to the desk. Yeah. Well, the, 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 the issue is what you think open means. If it, if it just means give me access to, which in children's early uses is seems to be or it's useful and it's used for um, you know undoing a safety pin, getting the button undone, taking off the coat, unlacing shoes. There's a very disparate set of things that open can get applied to, um, but it gets much more specific as they learn the verbs that partition this domain in English. Now it's partitioned very differently, for instance, in English and French or English and Spanish. Um, but um, so when I say partial, I mean that the child has adopted one word which is then applied very widely to this whole domain um, but um, they don't know that there are restrictions on what counts as opening versus undoing versus taking off and so on so it's in that sense i want to call it a partial meaning can you give an example of a non-partial meaning um i would say um, someone who, let me stick with open, who uses open very much along the lines where it's used in English. So you can open windows, you can open doors, uh, you can open jars, um, you can't open TVs, you can't open lights, can in French of course, um, and so, and you can't open apples, you peel them. So, you know, what the child has to learn is for many of these event types, there is a very specific verb that is used in that language for that activity. Um, and what they've done is, is apply open uh, much more broadly, but then they start narrowing it down. Same with elm, one assumes. I mean, I, 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 I look, look at those six elms out there and yeah. half of them are... Well, no, beaches. <laughs> no, let's see, what's the other... Beaches. One? Beaches. 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 Yeah, right, right. right. Yeah, uh, the, I, I guess the example of Dalmatian dog was reminding me of what adults do in cases like um, pinky finger or tuna fish yes. or ATM machine or pin number. Yes. Some of those may be opaque. Yes. Uh, and then, of course, there's variation. So in some languages, you do say thumb finger. And, and you know. But the, what I was wondering about was the connection between the process that um, children undergo when they learn the restriction of open to those things that in adult language can be open once they learn uh, words like, um, uh, well, turn on, for instance, then they automatically, uh, in a sense, restrict uh, open, although it may take a while. That reminded me very much of what you described in that uh, 1987 paper, uh, Contrast, where children will say things like, uh, tooth guy to refer to the dentist yes. and plant man to refer to the gardener. Uh, generalizing in that case, not the uh, denotation of a word, but the application of a rule. And then once that, that becomes restricted, 
then automatically they will no longer call the gardener a plant man. And again, there may be an overlap. But yeah, I mean, that's a case of preemption because of yes. the lexical item for right. that particular role. He's a gardener, right. and you call him that. But in a sense, this is preemption by synonymy as well, because otherwise they could go on saying either open or turn on, but they won't. You're right, so. you're right, yes. Contrast is preemption. Yeah. So, so contrast is, in fact, the, the sort of governing principle yeah. here, yeah. that you know, once children realize these terms, contrast, and fill that part of the domain, right. that's what they need to use. And that's what they're getting, of course, from the people around them talking about right. that right. kind of event. Um, yeah. Okay, um, so I have another question for Professor, for Professor Clark. So I was wondering what you think about the nature of children's conceptual representations about these things. So for example, for open, do you think that they have the wrong concept when they start out, or do they have the correct concept all along, and it is just a question of learning how their language carves out the semantic space. Because for example, uh, I opened the TV because I'm a speaker of English. So that's a very common mistake that I make. Um, because for me, the concept of opening extends to all these uh, cases, or the case of work. No. But I don't think that the concept is, is wrong. I think that the children have um, part of the concept that is, in fact, underlying um, adult uses of open in English. But what they haven't got yet is the restrictions on it. So it only applies to certain types of events. That So giving you access to something, which seems to be the, the first meaning that they have, the partial meaning they have, um, uh, you know, will work in a lot of contexts. But the, in many cases, you use different verbs for that, that part of the domain. And what they have to do is realize that that meaning also belongs in these other verbs, but there are other details of it. That is, what kinds of objects are involved in the action, um, and what kinds of thing I'm getting access to um, that affect my choice of word for these event types. And so what they're having to do is say, yes, this part of the conceptual meaning is, is right, but it's only part of the conceptual meaning. And what I've got to do is sort out what else belongs in there uh, so that, in fact, I can distinguish when I use uh, turn on, when I use um, take off, when I use undo, uh, when I use open. So I, I think it, it's, um, you know, at both ends, you've got to do quite a lot of work, both of what the full conceptual um, part, of, part of the conceptual domain is for, the, for that verb, for open, and uh, what the restrictions are on its use in particular contexts. And this is something which is actually varies quite a bit by language. All right. Uh, is there any uh, comprehension data on that? Because you know, production data can be unreliable. Right. I I agree with you. I don't think there is, mm -hmm. and that would be a very nice topic to take up. Mm -hmm. um, however, you're going to be working with children between one and two and a half, right? <laughs> <laughs> which is um, intensive. <laughs> actually leads them to, to land on a particular item, right? So we have this diverse set of lexical tools to convey these different intentions, and they settle on one. And it can't just be frequency, we know this, and it can't just simply be association with a certain context. So they're choosing uh, these words for very specific yeah. reasons. I wonder if you can comment, I have some ideas, but uh, I wonder what yours are about what other factors behind the scenes are driving them towards specific uh, choices uh, to, to be wrong with or, or to be partial Open with? Open and or. Yeah, right. Well, I think that, actually, I think those are both cases where, where uh, children are attending to what adults say when they say, do you want to open it? Um, and um, can you open the door? Which is a frequent request when the door is ajar. A child could actually pull it open, not reaching the handle, but pulling the edge. Um, and the surprise in the original Griffiths and Atkinson study was that half the children actually had adopted the door as their term to cover all these um, different um, events, sub-events, um, and the other half had picked open. 
Um, and I think it's because they, they, pick, they pick from that phrase, Dor receives stress, it's the last um, term in the, in the utterance, but open is you know, very common. Do you want to open that? Shall I open that? Uh, and again, receive stress. So I think that's probably the source. Um, and in many cases, uh, children pick up a word when it's part of a, a small interactive game, like the buy with the finger puppet. Um, so I think that you know, there are probably a number of different factors that, that are involved in their initial uptake of, of a word. And it also helps if it's pronounced yeah, I will offer uh, three more. <laughs> yeah, the pronounceability, yes. Yes. Actually, the, uh, like uh, what the Luce and Yusuf work on uh, uh, phonological neighborhood density yeah, within right. the words, these are the critical factors. Mm -hmm. Also, actually, the uh, I have some evidence now for semantic and syntactic distributional information driving early lexical acquisitions. Actually, it may be that these words that they settle on have a, a, a more stable semantic profiles mm -hmm. in the input. Not just that there's high frequency examples, mm -hmm. but actually that the way that they get used, the context, uh, the context in which they are used, stay more stable. Mm -hmm. uh, this is that, a, that's a tricky argument because then you look at at where the child is using open and it doesn't match the adult distribution. No, no, no. But at one point, yeah. But the predictivity comes from the adult data mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it predicts uh, age of acquisition and uh, and yeah. uh, and the okay. the number of uh, productions per child in these early years. So. Uh, okay. Send me the. Yes, I will. No, I'm very happy to. Yeah, I think and then then Herb, you, you're next. I should be last. Well, uh, you, you, you yeah, you're you people first. <laughs> so um, for Lee, um, I was wondering if you had so you had this gr nice gradient score of how con sorry how context how much context they were able to provide when like when prompted. Right. And I was I thought that was so interesting and I was wondering how you got so much gradient in that score. Like are you coding things like how much additional like how how much it evokes for them? It's, or like, it's not as gradient. It's um it's it like overall it's average over the items and then there's a the subject mean. So it's 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 not uh, the points are jittered because a lot of them overlap. So that's why it looks um, Continuous. Okay, I just yeah. think it'd be so interesting to look look back at those recordings right. once you have them because I think a lot of ways that we succeed at at using extensions um, in ways that people like is like we we really like a, a word evokes a, a whole scene or an event and we like we're so familiar with that event and we can like pull like extended metaphor yeah, right. or something like that out yeah. of it to like really give rise to like a whole scene, and I think that's, that would be so interesting. That's something that we, we started working on, Chisa and I, of like looking at the responses and seeing like what are the dimensions of variability in these responses beyond like did they understand the time or not, like in uh, what ways did they justify, you know, what were privileged participants in these structures, um, but that, that's very much in, in progress, yeah. Because I think that's the difference between knowing that a bachelor is an unmarried man and knowing that you can't use bachelor to refer to like mm -hmm. a priest, right? Yeah. There's all of this yeah, background for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a question for Andy. Yeah. So um, uh, I try, I was remembering the original um, source for the hamburger. Um, you know, the, the hamburger uh, wants it. You know, wants something. Yeah, right? sandwich. This, <laughs> this goes back to um, number. Yeah, number. Yeah, number. Now, the thing about all of his examples was that there was an elaborate, or quite an elaborate, context that I mentioned a person who ordered a hamburger. So now I can go back to this person and say, well, the hamburger in the corner wants some more ketchup. Yep. Now, you're, so, but that, notice that um, I can understand the hamburger in the corner wants some more ketchup, but it takes me a while to figure out the hamburger in the corner, I got already a hamburger in the corner. Unless I have been introduced to this person who ordered a hamburger ahead of time. Now, you're, in your context, you have no introduction to anything except um, 
he went over to the, the, what the, the, the yeah, the you mean the one for the contact solicitation where they just got the, like the, yeah. the my dad collected Hutchinson yeah. Will. Yeah, so right. those are really uh, empty. That is, they, they make it so that you really have to work to construct a context in which those things work. So if you think of it, it's the complexity of the context that you have to construct in order to get that to make sense. But Number did this by having the whole context there, and in your experiment, you right. didn't have that kind of elaborate context for those exam those sorts of examples. I didn't need them for the for your conventional cases, but I did need them for the the other cases. That uh, is, I would have thought that that was sort of a, a thought to be a really odd sentence in the middle of uh, a context. Sorry, in the middle of a discourse in which there was no mention of this hamburger and a guy ordering a hamburger ahead of time. I mean, that's you have the in there, and it's referring to some individual or what individual. Right. So I, I mean, that's part of the nature of how that experiment went, though, right? We're we're seeking to elicit, you know, when you get this totally like unlicensed metonymy, what what are you coming up with? What are your strategies yeah. for like yeah. as, as the child we help them, we're like, can you think of someone like somewhere you might be? Where would you where would you hear this? And they're like, well maybe maybe in a store. And so the, they often a lot of the successful ones had that progression where it wasn't like, what is this? I know. It's like, well can you can you think of somebody like who might say something like this? Or like where are you and so it, you you kind of build it up. Um, and so in, uh, in all of the other studies, though, they did have those, those licensing contexts beforehand. So they're in, the, in the adult study, there are more novel ones. So that the restaurant ones get overworked, but like... But, but give, yeah. me a, give me one of the context that you showed on a slide seemed like really remarkably empty. I mean, they were just bare context. They, were, they, didn't, they hadn't introduced any. Oh, OK. Uh, yeah, so, so things like uh, on an airplane, the flight, one flight attendant says to the pilot, you know, C15A uh, is still standing, we can't take off now, right? So I think adults perform like, you know, the, very the much appendicitis in, the in room 15. Yeah, the, the, right. So there seems to be this um, distribution of, of scenes, uh, of schemas that, you know, correspond to like our frequency of encountering them, right? And we have some that are like, uh, in a shoe store, the red Adidas wants to pay in cash. Mm -hmm. That's one of them. They're, uh, and an adult perform very much at ceilings, so we, we take that to be like, well, that's that's kind of enough you need, right? Um, well, even though you might, of course, you do have to construct then. Yeah. Right, for sure, and that's exactly what those two measures are doing. So, like, you know, what what are they doing? When are when in the sentence are they doing it? What brain regions are actively uh, recruited? Because we want them to work a little bit, right? We're we're trying to see where this is going. I'm parked around the corner of this. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Cars. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, yeah, so I, I'm parked around the corner. I'm parked down the street. Or, you know, uh, a car ran into me the other day. Right. Ambiguous. <laughs> so, a comment and a question. Uh, wait. Comments and a question, of course. Um, the comment is that uh, Frank Kyle, a few years back, came and gave a presentation about, in a way, it was like partial meanings, and he was shocked at the fact that he's finding that so many people did not know the difference between a zucchini and a cucumber. Mm -hmm. So they, of course, these are adults, quite competent, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Turns out that when people were okay. checked in the department, this is a colloquium, half of the department did not really know the difference between <laughs> a zucchini and a cucumber. It's contextual. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You're kidding. You mean, they, it's not just that they couldn't tell them apart. They literally didn't know. Well, so, so they could, yeah, yeah, they had a thing. They knew they were different. Yes, like, yeah, yeah they because they had different, different words, like different, <laughs> different. Just like different almond beans. Well, yeah. <laughs> zucchini. But they didn't know that one is, is that you put in a the tree and the other one you put in a salad. That, yes. yeah, that's or when you cook and the other you don't. That's right, yes. the other one. But so, so that, I mean, so this idea, I think is, I agree and, and it's, it's very pertinent that you are actually, you know, head face on. But um, the other thing, as you were uh, talk, giving, a, I think you already gave the answer, but let me check with you. So the, the um, I was, as you were talking about, okay, so these kids are generalized and then always the issue is how do they retreat? If you call it narrowing, and it occurred to me, and I, this is what I want to check with you, is 
whether um, as you narrow, you're actually, you're not narrowing because you're being able to say less, but in fact, you're able to say more. Yes. So that, you know, say- You added work, additional lexical items. That's right. So, which take over part of, of that domain. So you're thinking, I was thinking, yes, you can say I open an orange, which is beautiful, but you cannot really close an orange. Right. But yeah, so that, so then close is no longer, can no longer apply, so you have it halfway, and that it's already, you know, impoverishing. Right. Uh, what, what we, I mean, one of the things I've worked on is looking at what goes on in adult-child interaction. And one of the things that, um, that you get is, say, even a, a child as old as three saying, can you open this for me, holding up an orange, and his mother says, do you want me to peel it? And the child says, yes. <laughs> and, so, and then he's repeated, peel it. So I think that what you get is an awful lot of conversational interaction where um, adults actually replace the open with the more specific, uh, uh, yes. relevant verb for that part of the domain. And so fruit gets pulled out of it because you peel fruit and you don't open it. Um, one question I had when it came to this kind of partial eating situation is, do you have any sense of, or, or have you come across situations in your study of this where kids just never, never narrow? Um, in that, I mean, we have to have you know language change <laughs> some kind of way. So I, the, the 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 reason I think about this is because I only a month ago discovered that my mom and I have two very different definitions for pajamas. <laughs> I'm in my twenties now, and you'd think this would be you know something I would have noticed a long time ago. But, um, <laughs> I, I mean, I'm going to pack, you know, for actually for a conference. Um, and, and I said, oh, um, you know, I need to pack some pajamas. She said, okay, great. Um, do you want me to lend you some? And I said, no, you know, I've got, you know, some pajama pants here, and I've got kind of a nightgown over here. I'll just pack these. This is fine. And she looks at me and she says, but I thought you wanted pajamas. <laughs> and I said, well, I sleep in these. So, yeah, this is good. We're good. But over the course of this discussion, and I said, okay, no, as a linguist, I cannot accept this. <laughs> we have a conversation, and over the course of this conversation, she, she's used to this by now. I mean, she knows. Um, she said, you know, for me, pajama still has to be the kind of pants and a top set with a collar and, you know, maybe cuffed uh, sleeves and cuffed, you know, yeah, pants she's and maybe right. a <laughs> And so this is why we start, she started calling her friends. And I started calling my <laughs> We've got, you know, a lot of people in my mom's, you know, 60 and up age group who are saying, no, pajamas are this, you know, matching set. And people say, you know, 40 and below, and who we were surveying are like me and saying, well, pajamas are just what I sleep in. It could be anything. And so I'm wondering, you know, at some point, clearly, I never narrowed. It was just, right. well, it's, it's very hard to know. <laughs> Most of the work looking at where language, one of the things that children get very attentive to is what the conventional term is in this context. And so, and they, you know, seven year olds are extremely prescriptive to three and four year olds in the same family about what they should be calling things or how they should talk about things. Um, and I think they become very attentive to the conventions. So, um, and this makes sense when you look at the fact that much of the language change seems to come from teenagers and young adults, mm -hmm. not from young children. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think maybe you didn't change, but uh, where you had influence was as a, a teenager. That, and and I, I'm an only child too, so there is yeah. no one to go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Yes. So I think we are finished. So thank you both.